Hi folks, Tris here. Thanks for listening to Season 2 of Modem Prometheus. If you want more ahead of Season 3, join our Patreon to listen to the Season 2 bonus episode, announced in the main feed soon, at patreon.com forward slash modem prometheus. Members also get free merch, early access, and our sincere thanks. The whole podcast is supported by you. Today's season finale is about being honest with yourself. I'm going to tell you a horror story. I've not done one of these before. These stories I've been telling you recently. You might have noticed a theme. Gods. Ghosts. The child returning after a life cut short. A family waiting for the man who took one of their own. A journey to judgement in a world as sharp as ice. All of them about what happens when the night bus finally stops for you. Stops, as it surely will. Stops like your own tired heart. I told you those stories because I thought you needed it. Because who doesn't need a little cheering up now and then? But this is not one of those stories. In this story, bad things happen. Shall we begin? There is a man walking up a staircase, toward a flat he has never been in before. We'll call him James, because it is a nice name, and it doesn't matter what his name really is. If we're honest, very little about him matters at all. He could be anyone, even you. It is a low-rise block, four floors of boring, solidly built flats. The kind built when you try to provide houses rather than homes. He climbs a concrete staircase. The lift is fine, but he wants the exercise. Storms have been hammering the city recently, and he's not been able to get his 10,000 steps. As he climbs, he sees fresh whitewash covering a mural that threatened to give the place a personality. He knocks on the solid, boring front door, and his dead wife opens it. He stares for a moment, his pre-prepared intro short-circuited, and she has to say, Hi, are you the investigator? Before he remembers how to speak. Uh, yes. Sorry, (laughs) clearly not enough coffee this morning. Um, here. He holds up a laminated ID card held in a lanyard round his neck, like he'd come to read the meter. She was the one who arranged this visit, but it never hurts to look official in his line of work. It has his name, passport photo, and Paranormal Investigator written on it in utility company Sans Serif. Oh, thank you, thank you, she says, the relief evident in her voice. Come on in, uh, I'll make you that coffee. He's doing a mental checklist as she walks to the kitchen. Hair, face, height, that quirk of the mouth when she said, come on in. The slight unconscious head jerk in the direction she wanted him to move. All things he remembers, from a woman who died a year ago. The coffee comes black. Exactly how he likes it. Exactly how Claire used to make. Good guess, he says, sipping at it. She gives him a weak smile. So, how do we do this? He starts up a recorder app on his phone. First of all, I'd like you to describe what's been happening. When it started, and if there was any event that you feel like kicked it off. I might ask a couple of questions to clarify things, but I'm going to try to let you just talk as much as possible. Then I'll have a look around and set up the recording equipment. So she talks. She's lived here for about a year, but the haunting is recent. Or at least, it's become more noticeable. She remembers waking up a couple of times in the night over the past year and thinking she could hear voices, faint, unintelligible. But she put it down to interrupted dreams still bouncing around her head. But recently, over the last couple of weeks, she started hearing footsteps in her room at night when no one else is there. The voices are definitely voices now, still not saying anything she can understand, but they're louder and definitely not part of a dream. She got up in the morning, 
to find all the books on the living room shelf thrown to the floor. He checks the shelf. It's a bit wobbly, but not so much the books could fall on their own. He checks the bedroom. It's cold and smells a little damp, but there's no visible signs of haunting in the light. There's a built-in set of wardrobes along one wall. The one in the far corner is padlocked shut. It's the maintenance cupboard, she says when he asks. Maybe? I don't know what you call them. It's got the water and gas mains for the building running through it. I've got the key and a drawer in the kitchen, but I don't think I've opened it since I moved in. Which was... about a year ago. She says the line like it's in a script. She follows him as he runs through his checklist. Floorboards. Thermostat. Ectoplasmic residue stains. Honestly, she says, it's beginning to scare me. I don't know what I did or why it started. I just want it to stop. He nods, understanding. It's all he can do not to give her a hug. Tell her it'll be okay. He's missed her so much. There was a night, about a year ago, when Claire left the house and never came home again. She called, See you later, and shut the door, and that was it. He didn't say, I love you, though he did. He didn't say, be safe, though he wanted her to be. He didn't say those things, because there was no need to say those things. She was going to see a band like she'd gone to see dozens of others, and then she was going to come home and they'd have a whole nother day tomorrow. Instead, he said, have fun, but only after the door had closed and she couldn't hear him. And he didn't care that she didn't hear him because he knew she was going to have fun and she would tell him about it when she came home. But she didn't come home. He'd waited and waited and she hadn't come home. Back then, his investigation business had only been part-time. He'd spent four days a week in an office HR department filing reviews processing CVs, and spending all his considerable downtime on reading ghost reports on Reddit. The other three days, he'd been conducting ghost hunts of his own. He'd even taken Claire on one, for an early date. She'd never had the interest he did, but she'd indulged him. Tell you what, she'd said. If I go first, I'll come back. Then, if you haven't found a ghost by that point, I'll be your first one. What if I go first? He'd asked. Then you can haunt someone else. I don't want ectoplasm dripping in my kitchen. After that night, it became more urgent. He'd quit the office job, gone full time. He made less money, but with some occasional temping it was enough. He'd since investigated dozens of ghost reports. Some he was paid for, some he did for himself. Some he had debunked. It was important to be objective. But the ones he clung to were the ones he couldn't explain. The ones that made him feel like he was so close to knowing the truth of death. But he didn't yet have proof. He'd never seen a ghost with his own eyes. Until now. Until she had opened the door to him. He starts with the cameras. Motion-sensitive, high-capacity SD cards, infrared sensors for night vision. But they'll detect the dead, as well as deer. They're placed in every room, to catch the activity they know about and see if there's any they don't. Hauntings can be subtle. There's a whole thread on the forum about haunting signs that are easy to miss. He has a whole checklist devoted to them. So, um, he says, the bedroom. I cannot place one here if you'd prefer no she says it's fine then mics one for every camera and others dotted around the house we'll likely get some false positives on these he says there's another storm coming in tonight if it's anything like the last couple the rain will probably be loud enough to trigger it from time to time oh yeah it feels like it's been raining forever it's only been a couple of weeks he thinks but doesn't say it as he suggested, she follows him around as he installs them. If strange men are going to bug your house, it's worth knowing where. 
Then, temperature sensors connected to the kind of hobbyist weather station you can get off Amazon. They're cheap and inaccurate, but perfectly serviceable when you care more about the change than the level. He wishes he had something similar for electromagnetic fields, but has never found it. Finally, he provides her with a map of where everything's been placed, and gives her a form to sign. Consent is important. Should I stay here? She asks. Yes, ideally. The presence may not manifest without you here. You think it's... tied? To me? I don't know. But tonight, it would be better if we kept things as normal as possible. She nods, twisting her lip a bit. He remembers that gesture, too. From any time Claire knew something unpleasant was in her future. He looks away so she doesn't see he's noticed. He started a thread on the Ghost Hunter forum about this investigation. He does this frequently. He's a big noise there. It's full of people who want to investigate the paranormal. Very few who have managed to do it professionally. Showing an investigation in progress is guaranteed to get likes, and the comments, at least from the other more seasoned members, are often useful. He describes the haunting manifestations, the setup and equipment he's using, no location, no identity, no identifiable information, pictures of the equipment taken before they go into the house. He created the first post before he'd even gone to the location, set up. Logistics, the usual. The thread is full of people commenting appreciatively on the setup or with theories about the cause of the manifestation. Now he looks at a post he has drafted, explaining how the door opened and it was her. It was her. It was the woman he's been searching for. For the last year manifesting right in front of him, who said she'd been there a year, the exact amount of time since Claire had died and he didn't even know if this was a haunting or something else, but she was there after all this time. She was there. He glances at his phone, filled with pictures of Claire that he cannot bear to look at. He deletes the draft and closes the laptop. When she opens the door the next day, her hair is bedraggled and she has bags under her eyes. She is the most beautiful thing he has ever seen. Was it bad last night? He asks. Yes? She doesn't sound sure. Kind of. It was just constant. I woke up a bit after two. I think the rain did it. And then there were the footsteps. And the voices. And they just didn't stop. I kept waiting for something to happen, but they just kept going and going. She leads him into the living room. So I ended up coming to sleep on the sofa where I found this. The books are scattered, everything tipped off the shelf. Have you touched them? No. He bends down to look at the titles. Of the set, one catches his eye. Eurydice. The story of a man trying to pull his wife from the underworld. He glances up at her. She's looking at him curiously as if waiting for reaction. He's careful not to give her one. He doesn't know it's her yet. He wants it to be. Wants it so hard his lungs forget to breathe when he looks at her. But something doesn't seem right. Something's wrong about this whole thing. It reminds him of another investigation. An old townhouse which had seemed benign on the surface until he touched the wrong thing and all the lights started flickering as his EMF meter went haywire. There was the same undercurrent of menace. He shakes himself and straightens up. Okay. Okay. I'll collect the data and review the footage and we'll see what we can find. He doesn't review the footage in the house. He takes it to his office. A small room almost exactly the size of his desk. It's more expensive than a co-working space but it means he has a threshold he can scatter with salt. He starts with the living room camera. It registers a movement at around half past midnight. The house is dark by this point. Claire, no. 
the client, is clearly in bed already, but he can see, in the camera's night vision, the books wobble before tumbling from the shelf. It's not a violent throw. Not the kind of thing you see when someone's tied a fishing line to it and is pulling from off screen. No more effort than is needed. The camera's motion sensor lights up another couple of times in the night, but he can't see anything moving when it does. The books remain where they fell. The bedroom camera doesn't have anything unusual at the time the books were knocked off, which is weird in itself. Hauntings, he's read, tend to make things happen together, but there's just cl- the client asleep under the duvet, hair fanned out across a pillow. No, wait, the closet door, it's moving, very lightly. Not the kind of pounding you might expect from an aggressive haunting, but it's visibly rattling, pushing in and out until the range of movement is stopped by the padlock. The audio on that camera registers activity at around one as the night storm begins to batter the window. About half an hour later, it starts. Tap. 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 The steady rhythm of footsteps. There's an undertone too, a background static he can't properly make out, possibly the voices Claire mentioned, too faint to make out here. Not Claire. She's not Claire. She's the client. She's just the client. She's the client. And why hasn't she ever mentioned her name? He stays over the next night. He needs to see it for himself. Discover precisely what is going on in this house. She will not be there. I just want one night of peace, she says. Do you know where you'll stay? He asks. I'll find somewhere. He sets up in the living room, his laptop connected to live feeds from every camera in the house. Another storm is on the way. It's the season, the weather forecasters on TV tell him. Something to do with the jet stream and a warming ocean. He orders a takeaway and makes liberal use of the coffee machine. She's told him to do so as much as he likes, said she knows what it's like to pull an all-nighter. She still hasn't told him her name. He realises, also, he hasn't asked. Usually it's part of his introductory patter, but he opened the door and looked at her and his brain just died. There's a creak from somewhere in the house. His head snaps around like a dog smelling meat. He grabs his EMF sensor and goes to investigate, but doesn't hear anything else, see anything out of place, and the little dial remains around normal. Maybe just noise from a neighbour. He makes another coffee, returns to his laptop, reads the Ghost Hunter forum on his phone, while keeping half an eye on his laptop screen. He takes a screen grab of the current readouts and posts it to his thread. Someone else has posted a thread titled First Sighting! And he reads it. It's the usual story. Empty house, late at night, noises, picture of a blurred figure shape. It's already been explained and debunked by a dozen other posters before he gets there. These threads are always exciting and always the same. No one on the forum, as far as he can tell, has ever seen a ghost. His takeaway turns up, the rider handing over his chow mein and spring rolls while looking over his left shoulder. He looks back, but doesn't see anything there. If the rider did see something, she doesn't mention it. Just says, thanks for the tip, before leaving. He sits down, starts eating, and stops. There's a sound coming from somewhere. Like someone's scratching the walls. Quiet. He's not surprised his cameras didn't register it, but definitely there. He posts quickly. There are noises in this house, going to investigate. He moves around the house. Not in the kitchen, not in the bedroom, just the living room. Scratch, scratch, drifting around the room. Hello, he says. 
I don't want to hurt you. I just want to see you. No response. The scratches keep moving before stopping. They're coming from below, he realizes. The floorboards. A psychic memory of footsteps? This place isn't old enough for that. Unless something bad happened here that he hasn't been told about. His mind goes back to a night he spent in an abandoned squat, where people had reported faces at an upstairs window. He never saw the face, but the whole night he was kept up by scratching in the walls, like the presence was always in the next room, looking for the door. He makes more coffee, waits, eats most of the takeaway, leaves the scraps in the kitchen, waits. The storm has properly started now. The rain is drumming hard on the windows. If the scratching was still happening, he wouldn't know. It'd be drowned out. And then he hears it. Tap. 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 A solid, regular beat of boot on floor. It's faint, but it's there over the pounding of the rain. He scrambles to the laptop bringing up the audio feed from the bedroom camera. It's spiking, regular as a heartbeat, if right now much slower than his own. He grabs his EMF meter and moves cautiously to the bedroom, like the ghost is an animal he might frighten off, but the taps keep tapping and they're definitely getting louder as he approaches. And that, is that the voices? They're faint, but they sound human though they're not saying anything he can understand. He waits in the doorway. They're definitely here now. And the damp smell is stronger than he remembers too. Some kind of residual olfactory manifestation? Hello? He says. There is no answer. The EMF sensor remains steady. The tapping doesn't seem to be moving. Not like you'd expect footsteps to do. Not like the scratching did earlier. He closes his eyes to pinpoint the source. The closet. Whatever it is, it's in the closet. The closet, which he notices, is rattling. The door pushing in and out, like something is weakly pressing, trying to get out. The smell gets stronger as he approaches. Damp. Rot. And neglect. It even feels colder. A draught blowing through the crack between door and frame, even though he knows there's no window in there. Oh no. He crosses himself. An instinctual prayer to a god he stopped believing in some time ago. His hand trembles as he unlocks the door. He wishes he didn't know what he's going to find here. He opens the door the smell of damp briefly overwhelming, and he sees it. The drip is coming from the ceiling. It doesn't look like a crack. It's just soaked through after weeks of rain. The smell of damp wood comes from the hole where the utility pipes go up through the building. Somewhere in the roof is a leak. In the corner of the closet is a cut-off, open pipe, travelling down through the floor. Presumably the remains of plumbing work years ago. From this, he hears the voices. He can't recognise the words, but he can tell a Bollywood soundtrack even from here. He will check, of course, he is a professional, but he suspects the door will be answered by someone who might be called Singh, who will apologise for falling asleep in front of the television. He returns to the living room, feeling like he's pushing through spiderweb and examines the shelf. Scratching under the floor, mouse droppings here. The book's pushed off as the little creature runs across here in the night. He notes, blandly, that his takeaway remains have been nibbled. Part of him tries to say there are still unanswered questions, but it's no use. Occam's brutal razor is drawing blood. Why does the drip only happen at night, when the storms have run all day? He doesn't know but expects, if he had access to the workspace, he'd find a tub placed there by a maintenance worker that overflowed at night when rain came in. Eurydice? Coincidence. It's just a book. 
only one thing left to check. He finds a photo of the client on the wall, with another woman he assumes is her mother. He brings up a photo of Claire in his phone. One of the ones he's tried to stop himself looking at, because when he does, that's it. He does nothing but stare for the rest of the day. They're different women. Similar, definitely. Similar height, hair, face shape, but she's not the same. He superimposed a dream on the world and ignored the ways it didn't fit, just like he's done for the past year. In fact, for the past several. And the reason he has not seen a ghost, the reason no one on the forums or anywhere else has seen one, it turns out, is simple. Claire is gone. She's been gone a long time and will be gone forever. He will never see her again. Her death could have been quick and painless or slow and drawn out. He will never know. She will never blow cold breath in his ear when no one else is in the house. She will not make pictures fall from the wall in the early hours. There is nothing left of her to do these things. It isn't just Claire, though that hurts. Hurts like someone has reached inside and pinched his main artery shut. It's knowing the scratching in the walls and the abandoned squat was rats. It's knowing the flickering lights in the townhouse were the product of ancient, degrading wiring. It's knowing that he always knew these things, but didn't want to look at them. But now, as he sits on the sofa of a woman who is not, has never been his wife, they are all he can see, and he will never again be able to look away. There are more posts on his forum thread. The last thing he posted was that he was going to investigate the noise. Now there are replies. It's been a while. Are you okay? Guys, I think this is bad. And yes, it is bad. And he is not okay. Because for the rest of his life, he will be able to do nothing but stare down the cold truth of death. There's no such thing as ghosts. Oh dear, I think I've upset you. I'm sorry. Please don't worry. It's okay. You don't really live in such a hateful place. When your time comes, which it will, you will ride the night bus. You will climb the ridge. You will make your choice. And maybe you will be static. Or maybe you will be signal. But you will be. I promise. You will be. It was just a story. Sweet dreams. That's a wrap for season two. Stay tuned after the credits for updates. Modern Prometheus is written by Neil Merton. The voice of the city is Kate Angier, with music and production by me, Tris Oten. And special thanks to our Patreon producer, John David. You've heard this. I've said it all before. Here are some updates. We're getting the Season 2 special ready and we'll be sending out free gifts to our patrons soon. If this sounds interesting, these and more delights are available at patreon.com forward slash modem prometheus. We're an independent production and so grateful for everyone's support. Season 3 pre-production begins now. Tell us what you'd like to hear more of in reviews on iTunes, Spotify or wherever you're listening to this. And who knows, maybe Neil will grant your wish. Modem Prometheus will return when there are more stories to tell and signals to send. Tune out your radio and turn it towards the transmitter mast. Maybe you will find us there. We all move in orbits, after all. <laughs>